Hello and welcome. My name is Holly Barr, Administrative and Education Assistant for TSSA. First off, we'd like to extend thanks to our sponsor, Watson & Taylor, for underwriting this event and keeping our webinar costs low. Our speaker today is Ann Pritchard Grady. She is President of Acclivity Performance and holds a Master's Degree in organizational communication and is a nationally recognized speaker, facilitator, consultant, and coach. She has taught at colleges and universities and helped lead organizations and improve communication skills in a variety of settings. Today, Anne is going to give us practical advice on how to deal with difficult customers in a productive way. We'll learn about a variety of personality traits and how to deal with each one differently and effectively. Welcome, Anne. Thank you so much, Holly. Thank you for having me. And hello, everybody. Welcome. Uh, today we're talking about a subject that is probably near and dear to many of your hearts. How do you deal with those difficult customers? Um, and you know, first, what I would say is take, take a look at this comment. It says, excuse me, I've got a question, which I'm sure we all have customers who ask a bunch of them. And you've got this guy who's angry saying, it'd be great if I didn't have all these customers distracting me. And I think sometimes the first thing we have to really think about is that customers are not an interruption to our work. They're the reason for it. So while they can be difficult, just like any person can be, uh, we really have to find a way to make them feel like they are the most important person that we're dealing with at any given moment. That's the way you influence behavior. That's the way you communicate effectively. So let's first take a look at who some of your difficult customers are. And I know that this might be a little bit different than other webinars that you've done. But what I would like you to do is take a moment and chat in some, of, some examples of people who are difficult customers. So if you see on the top right hand side of your screen, there's a little orange arrow. And if you click on that, it'll expand a box that allows you to chat. So I'm going to type in a question right now. Um, please share examples. I just typed in a, a question. Um, let's see. I'm going to send it to everyone. Actually, um, Holly, for me, it only lets me send it to the organizers and to the staff. But other folks are going to be able to send it in to everybody. So what I'd like you to do is, under that little box where it says chat, um, go ahead and chat in your questions but also chat in examples of difficult customers that you're having to experience so that I can answer those as we go through the webinar. Um, to the entire audience, Holly just put in, you can chat here. So um, folks, please go ahead and enter in examples of difficult customers that you deal with or difficult situations that you deal with. And I, I won't say your name, but I can certainly answer them as we're on the call. Um, for some people, difficult customers are the ones who are just in your face, screaming, yelling, being really frustrated. For others, it's customers who have no idea what they want, and they're completely indecisive and change their mind. Um, I got a chat in here that says, the angry customer that specifically tries to make you angry by making stories up and lying. So there are some folks who just resort to um, really just getting in your face or making things up. Others who are fighting with a spouse and you become the middleman. Um, you know, why is my bill so much every month? There are these late fees. I don't understand it. They argue everything. They question everything. Others just seem frustrated with the world and they can't seem to um, manage their own emotions. So difficult customers come in a lot of different shapes, sizes, and forms. And the more we understand about the way people communicate and the more we understand about the way they perceive the world, the more likely we are to have positive interactions. So please keep chatting in questions and difficult types of customers and I'll keep um, viewing the chat box as I go and, and responding to those. I really appreciate your participation. So let's first look at a few scenarios that leave customers feeling frustrated. Um, Fees, late fees, lot cut fees, all different. Anytime you involve money, you're going to have people be frustrated and upset. So whether they think it's not fair, whether they think it's too much, whether they're arguing with you about a date or a time, 
the fees in general can cause a lot of frustration. Um, and that goes in line with raising rent. I know in my storage unit, um, it seems like every year our fees are getting raised, our rent is getting raised, and it's frustrating for, for me, and, and I'm you know, not normally a difficult person. Well, I guess you could ask my husband. I don't think I'm normally a difficult person. But um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I've got a chat here that says I've paid $100 for a 10 by 10, and your price is 119 What are you going to do for me that's going to warrant that extra $20 that I'm going to have to pay? Um, and so all of those are really, that's a great example. You know, we, what, are, what have you done for me lately? What am I going to get for my extra money? Access rights is another thing that causes a lot of frustration. You know, my ex-boyfriend's name is on the lease, and um, I don't want him to be able to get into the unit, and I don't understand. Um, or, you know, I've got someone who doesn't want to fill out all the paperwork. They've got their friends outside waiting in a U-Haul trying to make sure that we get everything moved in that day, and I don't have time to fill out all this paperwork. Or I want to store ammunition or food or something else, that, or, or my neighbor, that I'm not allowed to store in there. So. Um, what are some other issues that cause frustration? Um, someone just chatted in the customer that threatens to turn you in for being rude when you have a smile on your face and you're being calm. And that's just an example that you can't please all people all the time. There are a lot of frustrating situations, people who are, you know, 80 to 90 percent of human behavior is based on the way we feel about ourselves at any given time. And unfortunately, you have a lot of people who have lots of stress in their lives. And they've got life situations or things that are going on. I mean, I can tell you personally, I have a severely mentally ill son. And when we were getting ready to put everything in storage, um, we walked in the storage facility and he had a full-blown meltdown in the middle of the, the management office. And so clearly that's not a typical situation, but it was one where my husband and I were very stressed. We had a truck full of stuff waiting to get loaded into the storage unit, and we had to fill out a bunch of paperwork that we probably should have done beforehand. And so it was a very stressful situation. And when you've got folks who are going through life changes or a divorce or someone uh, close to them has passed away and they're trying to store all of their materials, people can get frustrated and emotions can get high. So what do we do for that? What do we do to manage them? We really have two choices. Um, we can either react, which is what most of us do, or we can have a strategy in place. And the difference is pretty easy to understand. A reaction is an unconscious, habitual approach. Okay? It's basically when you see a phone number on your caller ID and you don't know who it is or, you're, or you do know who it is, even worse, and you're frustrated and you roll your eyes and you don't want to deal with that person, that's a reaction. When you roll your eyes because you've just heard another person complain, that's a reaction. Whereas a strategy is figuring out the most appropriate approach to handle that particular situation, that individual, that situation most appropriately. The thing you want to remember is that conflict is inevitable. It is going to happen. It's not very comfortable for anybody, but it is something that will happen just as the nature of your job in any customer-facing um, situation. That's what you're going to deal with. Combat, however, is when it becomes personal, and that is optional. It takes two people to play tug of war, and you can't do it alone. So your job is really, as the professional, as the storage facility to figure out how to diffuse conflict and to try to make it less frustrating for everyone involved. Now, I got a chat that said missing customer, uh, missing customers during auction time. You just can't find them. And then when you do, they make promises they just don't keep or the ones that pull on your heartstrings and make you want <laughs> to not want to auction their belongings. And that's really tough. You've got situations where people are sharing sob stories and and everything they can to get you to, to give them a little extra latitude. And the problem is once you give an inch, people take a yard. And so um, another chat came in, not being able to give information when they're not listed on the lease. So if you've got somebody who says, well, I'm you know, Bambi's spouse, and I need to understand what we've got in here, and I need to get in there, um, you simply can't do it. It's against the law. So 
and against the lease agreement. So there are, these are all great examples of difficult customer situations and things that could lead to conflict. And again, conflict is inevitable. It is when it's about an issue. Combat is when it becomes personal. So I want you to take a second and look at this picture and tell me what you see. Type in if you see a young lady or an old lady. So take a minute to look at this picture. And in that chat box, again, if you can't see the chat box, there's a small orange arrow at the top right-hand corner of your screen. If you click on that, it'll expand your chat box. Go ahead and chat in. Do you see an old lady, a young lady, or both? So we've got someone who sees a young lady. Go ahead and chat in. Do you see a young lady, an old lady, or both? I'll give you just a second to chat them in. All right, so some of you are seeing young ladies or lady. Some of you are seeing older ladies, and some of you are seeing both. And both are there. If you answered both, you're correct. Both the young lady and the old lady are there. And yet you could stare at this all day long, and somebody else might see one or the other. And you could try to convince them, well, the young lady's got her profile there, and, and she's got an eyelash. A lot of people are typing in. They're seeing a variety of young lady, old lady. Um, they're both there, and it's really interesting to me that you could look at this. It's kind of like one of those 3D images that you could stare at for 30 minutes, and <laughs> so you just sometimes you can see it, sometimes you can't, and then sometimes you see a glimpse of it, and then you lose it. The truth is we all see the world through our own lens. We all um, believe that, our, that what we see is true. It's our reality, and everybody communicates the way that they do because they think it's the right way. We wouldn't intentionally be difficult. So statistically, one in three people are considered difficult. So the next time you're in a room full of people, look around you. And if you don't see that person, chances are it could be you. So um, people have a tendency to be difficult in their own way. But the truth is we all see the world through our own lens. You could look at this picture all day long and not be able to see um, the young lady or the old lady based on your just natural lens and your perception until somebody points it out to you. And if you've ever had a conversation with someone where you've debated and argued till you're blue in the face and you're absolutely convinced that you're right, only to find out later that you're wrong, you understand how our perception can really shape our reality. Most people follow something called the golden rule, which is treating people the way they want to be treated. Um, you know, tr I, I would say in my life, I try to treat people the way I would want to be treated. Um, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And that's really a great philosophy when it comes to life. Unfortunately, that philosophy doesn't work very well when it comes to communication. Because not everybody wants to be treated like you. So the platinum rule is really taking time to figure out how people want to be treated and, and treating them that way. So instead of treating people like you want to be treated, treat people the way they want to be treated. And that really boils down to understanding communication and behavior. So a couple of PowerPoints of human behavior. And by the way, please chat in your questions as we're talking, um, as I'm talking, because I can look over and read your questions and respond to them at the appropriate time. So if you have questions, comments, observations, or if you disagree with anything that I'm saying, please chat in. Chances are you're going to learn just as much or more from each other than you will from me. So no question is dumb. All questions are welcome. And if you disagree with anything that I'm saying or have a question about how to apply some of the content that we're talking about, please feel free to chat in. So a couple of PowerPoints of human behavior. If I understand me better than you understand you, then I can guide the communication between us. And if I understand me and you better than you understand yourself, I can actually predict and guide how you will respond. Now, a lot of people might read this and say, well, that sounds like manipulation. Or maybe you read this and says, that sounds like my marriage. But if I understand how you're likely to react and respond to certain things, then I can shape my message to elicit the response I want from you. So if you think about folks that you're dealing with um, when you're leasing storage units, when you're dealing with tenants, when you're dealing with managers and supervisors, or um, dealing with each other as owners, 
you know, really think about and understand that we can only control ourselves. You know, you, you probably know as well as I do that it's tempting to want to fix other people, but unfortunately, you can only control yourself. And if you know how people are likely to react and respond, you can tailor your approach accordingly. So what I'm going to do is talk to you about different behavior styles, understanding the tendencies of each style, then figuring out how do I identify somebody's style, somebody that I'm dealing with, just based on our very brief interaction, how do I figure out their behavior style? And then most importantly, um, how do I modify my approach to handle them effectively so that I can get the reaction that I want? Um, one of the questions that was just chatted in, how do you handle treating a customer who's blatantly taking advantage of you when you're trying to help them? And that's a fantastic question. And that goes back to really communicating based on what their needs are. So let's, get, let's jump into the behavior styles, and then I'll come back and answer that question after we've gone through them. So if you've ever taken a behavioral assessment, like the Myers-Briggs, the Kiersey, DISC, um, performance indicator, insights, there's a million different tools and they're all based on Carl Jung and Jungian psychology. And basically what they say is that behavior style is very different than personality. Your behavior style is simply how you react and respond and how you communicate. It has nothing to do with your age, you could be 8 or 80 and have the same style. It has nothing to do with your education, you could have a PhD or a GED and have the same style. It has nothing to do with your ethics or your morals. And in fact, everybody is a little bit of all four of these. Everybody has some combination of all of them. So as I'm going through and reading them, you might say, well, those tendencies sound like me, but some of this other style sounds like me also. I don't understand. Um, and really, we have a little bit of all of them, but most people are more dominantly one than the other. Now, if your scores are all pretty close together, if we were to give you a formal assessment, your score your numerical score would range on a scale from 5 to 95, meaning nobody is a 0, nobody is a 100. And you might have two that are completely equal and even in their scores and others that are lower or higher. You could be even across all four styles. The closer you are to, to each style, the closer your scores are, that just means that you share a lot of tendencies of each of the styles and you can bounce back and forth between them and communicate fairly easily with people of those styles. The downside if your scores are fairly close together is that you're most likely not very consistent. So people don't necessarily know how to tell your style, how to communicate with you, or which version of you they're going to get based on the, the day, the time, the situation. Now my scores, for example, are very far apart. I have two styles that are very close together. My driver and expressive are very close together, but they're super high. And my amiable and analytical scores are very, very low. What that means is that I'm consistent. Usually people know what version of me they're going to get on any given day. I'm either driver or expressive. I bounce between them without even knowing that I'm doing it. I have to work very, very hard to be amiable and analytical because those scores are so much lower. And I can do it for about an hour and a half to two hours. So anytime we're forced to modify our style for long periods of time, we get tired. And just like when you're you know, exercising, you can't wait to be done and stop. The same thing holds true with when you're flexing your style. Uh, it's just like a muscle. The more you practice it, the better it gets, the easier it gets. But it's exhausting and it's tiring to try to come out of your comfort zone. Um, fortunately or unfortunately, you are in a customer service business. So the, the real thing I want you to take away is that it is 100% your responsibility to modify your approach, regardless of the customer's style. And that might not seem fair, it might not seem right, but it is what it is. And you can't control anybody else. So the number one concept that I would want you to take away, if you get nothing else from today's webinar, is the question, am I trying to be right or am I trying to get it right? Because your job in providing exceptional service and dealing with difficult customers is to focus on getting it right, not being right. I just got a chat question that said, is that why when we spend time with certain people we get so tired because we're exercising a certain type of communication that doesn't resonate with us? 
Absolutely. It's the reason when you're dealing with certain people, you feel like a Hoover vacuum has just sucked the life force from your body. It's the reason why when you're doing certain tasks, you feel exhausted, whereas other tasks can give you energy. Um, and that really is a lot of our communication boils down to our style. Now, if you think about the picture of the young lady and the old lady, we think we're right. Whatever version we see, we think we're right. Well, the same is true with communication. We communicate the way we do because we think it's right. We wouldn't intentionally communicate that way if we think it's wrong. So you've got customers who communicate in their own natural style, but who most likely don't understand these styles, don't understand why they're communicating that way. That's just what they've always known. And so your job is to, A, take a moment to recognize their style for what it is, not judge it right or wrong, good or bad. It just kind of is what it is. Then to figure out how do I, knowing this, how do I modify the way I approach this person? So let's go through each of the styles, and then we'll talk about combinations and how you can identify people's style. So the first style are drivers. These are the customers who are kind of in your face. They tend to be very loud, assertive. They're all about um, getting things done quickly. They walk fast, they talk fast, they eat fast, they multitask, they do a million things at once. They're all about, like, how can I get the fastest, best result possible? I don't have time to chit-chat. I don't have time to um, hear stories. I don't have time to read the lease agreement. I just want to get in, get out, get on my way. They live by the three B philosophy. Be brief, be bright, be gone. Um, they just really want to get stuff done. They're typically pretty competitive. They're very decisive. They make very quick decisions. So you might give them a couple of size choices, whereas some people would want to say, well, let me go home and measure everything I have, and let me think about it. A driver's just like, I'll take a 10 by 10, and that's it. Hurry up. Let's go. Um, they don't like wasting time or energy. They don't like being out of control. They're very impatient. They get angry very quickly, and they can appear pretty insensitive. So for some folks, these are the most difficult types of customers because they are very strong-willed. They are very assertive. When they're stressed out, they're aggressive. Um, and they're always focused on, how can we just get this done quicker, faster, easier, better? I don't have time for this. Um, in my estimation, drivers are one of the easier types of customers because you never have to read their minds. They will always tell you what they're thinking, what they're feeling, if they're frustrated, if they're angry. And it might not be fun to hear that they're frustrated or angry, but at least you can do something about it. So your drivers are very fast-paced, control-oriented, want what they want when they want it, um, not afraid to argue or speak up, very assertive. When they get stressed out, they get aggressive. Next style is expressive, and expressives tend to come in and tell you everything about themselves from you know, the time they were born until they are renting this storage unit. They want you to know why they're renting it, what they're putting in there. They'll share about their family. They'll even show you pictures sometimes. They really are very interactive and, and want to be liked and want to verbalize and talk with you and build a relationship. So. Um, for expressives, they tend to not be very detail-oriented, just like drivers. The same holds true for drivers, not very detail-oriented. They'll just skim through the lease agreement and sign it and then argue about it later. Um, they appear very disorganized and scattered. They're usually pretty happy and jovial, but they can also be extremely emotional. So if it's a difficult time and they're running a storage facility because of a death or a loss of a loved one, they become very emotional. Expressives tend to be more impulsive and more emotional in their decisions. So just like drivers, they're very big picture focused. Just like drivers, they're very fast paced and impatient. The difference is that drivers are all about just get it done, and expressives are about let's build a relationship while we get it done. Then you've got amiables. Now, these are the folks that will not tell you anything's wrong because they don't like conflict or confrontation. Amiables are very calm, quiet, patient. They're very loyal. Once you gain their business and do a good job, they'll stay with you forever, and they'll refer everybody they know to you. Um, but they're also kind of difficult because you never know if something's wrong until it's too late to fi fix it. So you'll ask, you know, how is your service experience? Are you getting everything you're needing? Are we doing everything we can um, to keep your business? And they'll say, yes, yes, fine, good, fine. And then you'll find out two weeks later that they've gone to the storage facility across the street because of something that you did that you had no idea you did, and it's too late to fix it. 
Uh, amiables are typically pretty indecisive. They have a hard time making decisions. They need time to process and think about things. So they'll come in and check rates of multiple different places. Um, but at the end of the day, it's more of an emotional choice. So they will go with the place that makes them feel the safest and makes them feel like the relationship will be there. Then you've got analytical. Now these are the folks who are going to question every single bullet on the lease agreement. They're going to challenge late fees. They're going to challenge um, different questions. They're going to want to understand all of the rules. If you say you can't store something, they want to know why. If you explain that they have to sign here, they want to know why and what it means. They tend to be very critical or skeptical. They don't like uncertainty. They are buy the book, follow the rules, want to comply with standards, but really want to understand what they're about to comply with. Um, so they want evidence to prove all of the things that you're talking about. They're probably ones who want to see copy of all of the laws written that support the lease agreement, and they're going to want to talk to the association and, and make sure that you're doing everything right. So analyticals tend to be much more slow-paced, just like amiables. They typically are more patient. They're more methodical. But like drivers, they're all about bottom line results. They're not touchy-feely. They don't tend to share a lot of emotion. Um, it's not really personal. It's just about, I'm here to rent the unit. Let's get it done. So all of these styles, again, everybody has some elements of each. But we all exist within a continuum. So if you look at the following graph, you see that you've got analyticals and drivers who are all about facts and results amiables and expressives who are typically more focused on relationships and people and emotions. You've got analyticals and amiables who are on the slow and patient side of the spectrum, and drivers and expressives that are more fast-paced and impatient. And everybody, like I said, has some element of each. So your, for example, your driver analytical style is not touchy-feely at all. They're all about, you know, get in, get out, get it done. They want it to be correct. They want fast results. They want to understand it. But it's very logic driven, very results driven, has not a lot to do with emotion. Amiable expressives, on the other hand, are much more focused on the emotion and how it feels when they walk in and, and did somebody talk to them. So for example, I'm an expressive. And when my son Evan had a meltdown in the middle of the storage unit facility, the college student who was working there was so fantastic. He said, oh. You know, I used to do that all the time when I was little. Let's walk around and let me show you some of the storage units and let me show you the different sizes and we can talk about what kind of bugs you could put in there. Not, not really that we were going to store bugs, but my son loves bugs and lizards and he had a big picture of a bug on his shirt. And so the, the young college student who was working at the storage facility really engaged him. And that, as an expressive, made me want to rent there because it was about a feeling. It was about that he was trying to do something nice. It had nothing to do, you know, quite honestly, the place down the street probably was a little bit less expensive and had the same security features and the same benefits. But at the end of the day, as an expressive, I went with the company that made me feel good. So amiables and expressives are generally more about relationships. Then you've got the analytical amiable. So this person is. Um, able to balance the facts and the relationships, but they're very slow paced. They want a lot of time to process. They're going to go to a dozen storage facilities and analyze and compare all of the different features and benefits and costs of each. Drivers and expressives are very, very fast paced, very impatient. Um, I went to one storage facility, um, didn't compare costs at all, just had a good experience there and said, okay, great, we'll take it. Didn't know what size I needed, didn't, wasn't even sure what I was going to store, just this sounds good, let's go for it. And it was more of an emotional, fast-paced decision. Then you've got the driver amiable combination and the analytical expressive combination, and those are a little bit harder to spot. But basically, you're looking for predominant style. So let's talk about how you deal with and engage customers that are each of those styles. So with drivers, you really want to be clear, brief, get to the point. Get in, get out, help them get on their way. They don't want to talk about stories. They don't want to share about their family. They're typically very strong personalities. Um, they want to be in control. So give them choices that let them ultimately be in control. Now, your drivers are most likely going to be the ones in your face that are yelling at you. 
the best thing you can do for a driver is to give them the illusion of control. And I say illusion because you give them a couple of options that they can live with. For example, I'm not happy with the price. This is ridiculous. I can go somewhere else. What are you going to do for me? This is just blah, 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 blah. Well, great. Sorry, I understand. I can see that you're frustrated. We have a couple of options. We can move you to a smaller unit and keep the price point where you want it, or we can stay in this unit and have it be a little bit more understanding that we have amenities or security features that other facilities don't have. So it's certainly your decision. Want to make sure you understand the choice is yours. And that typically disarms a driver. Another thing that would disarm a driver is to say, I can see that you're frustrated. Not I, not I understand, because you don't understand how they feel, and that will create even more defensiveness. But if you say, I can see that you're frustrated, um, and then ba basically you have to be very strong with drivers. You can't back down. So if they see that they can take advantage of you or control of you, they will. But if you say something like, I can see you're frustrated, um, there's no, need, no reason to make this personal. I want to do whatever I can to keep your business and to treat you with respect. I'd appreciate it if you treated me the same way. With drivers, you have to be pretty strong personality to match them. Now, if you're an amiable and you don't like conflict and, you don't, and it's uncomfortable for you, it's going to be pretty uncomfortable dealing with a driver because you might feel like they're railroading you or trying to take over. And that's where flexing your style is so important. It's not easy. It doesn't seem fair. But if your goal is to get it right rather than to try to be right, then you have to come out of your own comfort zone and, it, and communicate with people in a way that they will be most receptive. That's the platinum rule. When you're dealing with expressives, there's two challenges. One, how do you get them to not talk so much? Because they're probably giving you every piece of information that you don't need or want or care about. And two, they can get very emotional. And so they try to be very persuasive. And, and they tend to exaggerate. So they might tell you another storage facility down the street is waiving the first month's rent or giving their truck for free and waiving the first month's rent. And you've got to really decipher what's accurate, what's not. Um, be careful with expressives. Make sure you put everything in writing. Make sure that you go over the lease agreement um, item by item, because expressives and drivers both are not very detail-oriented. And so with expressives, you want to make sure that they have a very clear understanding of what you expect from the get-go. You have to take some time and listen to them um, and let them kind of talk, because again, relationships are very important to them. Next, how do you deal with an amiable? Be calm. Don't expect an immediate answer. Give them time to process, time to think. Don't be pushy. If you've got an amiable that says they want to check out different rates and compare different facilities, great. Let them know that you're not going anywhere, that you're there. They're typically not going to challenge you. They're not going to be combative. They're the customers who you don't know if something's wrong until it's too late to fix it. So for them, you have to ask a lot of open-ended questions and probe. Um, what other storage facilities have you looked at? What are the things that you like about each of them? What are, if you could wave your wand and have a perfect facility and a perfect service experience, what would that look like? Really try to um, elicit uh, opinions from them and get them to share information. They want a lot of personal assurances and guarantees. They need time to think and process. And they really appreciate if you're trying to be cooperative rather than combative. Next, you've got analytical customers. With them, understand they're not trying to be difficult. They're just really trying to understand. So take your time to answer all of their questions without getting frustrated. If they challenge you, understand they're not trying to be difficult. They're just trying to understand. So don't get frustrated. Just show them um, where the information can be found or where they can get additional information if they're curious. Provide them with the data, the facts, the evidence, and give them plenty of time and space to make a decision. So make sure you give them lots of paperwork and demonstrate that you respect them by not pressuring them or getting frustrated at their questions. So one of the questions that we got before in the chat box was, how do you handle a customer who's blatantly taking advantage of you when you're trying to help them out? Well, one of the things that you can do is understand your own style and your own 
tendencies and understand what motivates people. So for example, drivers hate feeling like they're being taken advantage of. That's a big demotivator for drivers. Um, if they feel like they're being taken advantage of, they will become aggressive, um, they will become loud and outspoken, they don't like to feel out of control. So for drivers, you want to do your best to make sure you give them the illusion of control and give them lots of choices and t help them understand how you're going to get them to the result they need faster, quicker, easier than the other folks. With expressive, they want to be liked, so build a relationship with them. They really not need that social approval. With amiables, um, help them feel like they're minimizing risk. Let them know their things will be safe. Let them know that it's a calm, easy process and that, it, and that they don't have to worry about a lot of change. And with analyticals, again, help them not to be wrong. Because if, if you're trying to prove an analytical wrong, they're going to get defensive, frustrated, and they'll attack. So make sure that you try to find a win-win situation. Um, now this next slide doesn't necessarily apply to your customers. But what I would suggest is that if you have multiple people working at your location, if you have an owner, a manager, and a supervisor, or if you've got a couple of different people working different shifts, make sure you have these conversations with each other because it's just as important to have positive internal communication as it is to have external communication with your customers. A couple of things to think about. Um, in the absence of communication, we create our own message. So if you don't communicate everything in the lease agreement, or if you don't communicate your expectations, people will fill in the blanks, and they're usually not correct. But then it's the picture of the old lady and the young lady, and they're sure that the way they see it is correct. So the more information you can provide, the better. Uh, next, understand every behavior has a reason. And while people might seem difficult, there's a reason for what they're doing. Your job is to figure out what that reason is and how to work with it. Uh, next, emotion is always going to supersede logic. So if you're trying to be logical with someone that is yelling and emotional, you can be as calm as a cucumber and they are still going to be frustrated. And what I have found to work really great is to say, I see that you're frustrated. We can either finish this conversation when you've had a chance to calm down, or I can call you next week, or we can get back together when. But don't try to have a conversation when someone's emotional. It's not going to work. Next, you train people how to treat you. So if you've you know, let someone pay you late for six months, don't get frustrated at the seven month mark when they're really begging you to let them be late one more time. There are certain people that you just don't disrespect, and the only difference between them and other people that you know, might tolerate it is that they allow it to happen. So be careful how you train people, because people will rise or fall to meet your level of expectation, meaning if you perceive that someone's going to be difficult and you appear defensive, guess what? You're going to find all the reasons why that customer is difficult. Whereas if you are looking for all of the reasons this person is going to be receptive and looking for all of the ways that you can make the relationship work, you're more likely to find that as well. Next, if you're in a difficult situation, there are a few things that you can do to diffuse it. Um, first, listen actively. And what that means is don't try to think about what you're going to say while, you're, while they're talking. You can't listen and process your own message at the same time. Really listen. Ask questions. Try to understand. Use eye contact. If you're over the phone, Stay silent and don't interrupt, because people feel like they're not being heard when interrupted, and that creates defensiveness. Ask questions. That's a great way to diffuse conflict. Ask questions and make statements. If you find yourself getting defensive, take a step back and take a deep breath, because you're not contributing to a positive outcome. By validating and acknowledging others' feelings, it's things like saying, I can see that you're frustrated. I would be frustrated in this situation as well. I get frustrated when my rates get raised. I would get frustrated if my husband or wife weren't on the lease agreement and couldn't access our things. I would be frustrated in that situation too. I completely, completely empathize with your situation. It's different than saying, I understand how you feel. Because again, that creates frustration and resentment. We talked about getting it right rather than being right. Paraphrasing is a great way to de-escalate conflict. So I, 
when I paraphrase, I say things like, I want to make sure we're on the same page. I hear you saying that. Or I want to make sure I'm understanding where you're coming from. It sounds like you're saying this. That's a great way to de-escalate conflict because people know that they're being heard. Next, provide options. Give people choices. Like I said earlier, we can either move you to a smaller unit um, or one that's not climate controlled, or we can do this or that and give them a couple of options so that they feel like they're in control. Set expectations. We'll talk about that in just a moment because really it boils down um, to whether you're setting clear expectations and whether people are, if they're taking advantage of you, chances are you haven't set clear expectations. And then finally, Q-tip. Quit taking it personally. That's what Q-tip stands for. Again, people have so many things going on in their lives. Um, it very rarely has anything to do with you if you've got an upset or an irate customer. It may seem on the surface like they're upset about their rent being raised or not being able to get access to the, their things if they're not on the lease agreement. But in reality, they've got other bills they can't afford to pay. They've got co bill collectors trying to you know, manage them through things. They, they are typically very frustrated about a lot of other things that have nothing to do with you. Next, here are some questions. You'll get a copy of this presentation that will be uh, available for you. I have found that these questions are fantastic at diffusing conflict. So asking people, the, now obviously you wouldn't go quiz them on each of these questions, but pick the ones that fit the situation that you're in. For example, what am I not understanding works a whole lot better than, I've told you this three times, what part don't you get? Seems a little silly, but just the simple way you phrase the question is often helpful in diffusing conflict. Uh, you mentioned that there's a facility down the road that will give you your first month free. Tell me a little bit more about that. And they might say, well, yeah, they said that they'd give me my first month free, and you won't. And you might say, well, you're, you're exactly right. What they didn't tell you is that they'll charge you double if you, you know, make a late payment or, you know, they'll you can give them other information, but let them tell you about it because that makes them feel better and reduces defensiveness. All right, really the whole, it all boils down to expectations. So um, we had a client who had four nephews come to visit her for a weekend and she was saying that every time they came to visit her, they would always misbehave horribly. And so she made finally a poster that said, here are my expectations for your behavior. And they're all little boys under the age of 10. So her expectations were things like no biting, scratching, kicking, peeing in the pool, jumping off the roof. And she said, here's what an A player would do. An A player would not only follow these rules, they would lead by example and make sure other people were doing, other kids that were behaving the right way also. B players will do what you know they say they're going to do, but you always kind of have to remind them. And C players are the ones who are not going to listen. They'll always have an excuse. They'll always have a reason you can, why they can't do something. Now, you can probably relate to having customers that meet each of these criteria. You have your A players who are on time. They, they pay correctly each month. They're easy to deal with. They never break the rules. You wish you could clone them and have all of your um, tenants behave like that. Your B players are the ones where you might have to give them a couple of reminders but they typically do what they need to do. And your C players are the ones who are calling you every month saying, I can't make the rent this month. Could you please give me an extension? All of this boils down to expectations. So understand that if you want A player tenants, it is your job to clearly define your expectations and set boundaries and stay consistent with that. Just like with a child, if you tell them that there's something that they need to do and they don't do it and you let them get away with it, they'll take advantage of you every single time. So really communicate, here's what an A player tenant looks like. And you don't have to call it an A player tenant, but you can, in the lease agreement, be very clear about the expectations. If they've got a truckload of people waiting outside and they don't want to go through the lease item by item and you're so busy trying to get their business that you don't force that discussion, when they don't meet your expectations, it's really you have to take ownership of that because um, people need very clearly defined expectations for what behavior is acceptable or not acceptable. 
Next, if you've ever seen someone run a stop sign, chances are you probably got pretty frustrated and said things like, where are the cops when you need them? And they're so careless, and I can't believe they were willing to do that. And what a jerk. Well, if I had a guess, I'd be willing to bet that all of us have at one time or another run a stop sign unintentionally. And when we do it, it's, oh, no, I can't believe I wasn't paying attention. I hope nobody got hurt. I hope there's no cop around. The only difference between us doing it and someone else doing it is that when someone else does it, we attribute it to them being a bad person. When we do it, we understand that in that situation, it wasn't what we meant to do. So we attribute it to the circumstances, not who we are as a person. Look for the best in people. Instead of um, looking for all of the reasons why people are cranky or angry, look for the reasons that they're good customers and that they want to do the right thing. Because you find what you look for. In our family, we play the slug bug game. Every time we see a blue slug bug or any color slug bug, we hit each other and say, you know, red slug bug. When we started playing that game, we started seeing hundreds of Volkswagen Beetles all over the place. And it wasn't a conspiracy by Volkswagen to start pumping out more Beetles. It's that that's what we were looking for. So look for the reasons your customers are fair. Look for the reasons they're doing the right thing. Look for the reasons your tenants want to be flexible and work with you, not the reasons that they don't, because you tend to find what you're looking for. So those that really kind of concludes the content portion of it. Now what I'd like to do is open it up for questions on how you deal with specific situations. If you've got a difficult customer who is a certain behavior style or if you've got a conflict that's taking place or something that's even happening internally, um, take some time now and chat in some questions or uh, Holly can unmute you and we can have a discussion. see what kind of questions we're going to get. So far, we're not getting too many questions come in, but in your opinion, what would be the best type of, or the easiest type of personality style to deal with? Do you have one? I think it depends on your style. So as a driver and expressive, typically I deal well with other drivers and expressives because I understand the way they think. Um, mm -hmm. because that's the way I think. So I'm able to modify my approach more easily. Um, I think depending on your behavior style, it will determine what types of people are more difficult for you than others. For example, amiables and analyticals are typically very difficult for me because when an amiable is not giving me information or not sharing how they really feel or they're being passive aggressive, I get really frustrated. Or if an analytical is challenging me, um, my expressive style comes out and I tend to take it personally um, rather than understanding they're just trying to ask questions to understand. So I think it really depends on your own individual style as to what behavior style is most difficult or easy for you. Do you tend to get along well with your own personality style or is it sort of a cross, you know, a driver gets along better with an um, amiable because they can, they're opposite each other or is it does well, the, really saying that, the, the saying that opposites attract is very true. We tend to attract people who have styles that are, that are different than us because they complement some of the skills that we're lacking. But for example, um, you, know, you could have two people that are drivers, and they're both competing to be in control, and they're both trying to drive, and that could make it very difficult. Whereas you might have two other people that are drivers that understand that they have to manage control differently and give each other a turn to drive. So, there's so many more things that go into personality um, than just behavior style, but I do find that we tend to attract opposites at certain points in our life. But we also tend to do well with people that are that are our same style. Two expressives together will have a great time. That's why you have happy hours. Um, <laughs> two amiables tend to be pretty patient with each other, and analyticals respect the fact that they're each trying to understand. And and so I think. Again, that really just depends on the person. Okay. Well, we have a couple of questions that have come in. The first one from Susan is, I have a customer who will not move out even after given the 15-day move-out notice. She's asking what her next step is, which she'll, she'll probably have to take them to court. But is there a way that she can, you know, do you have a suggestion for her to maybe approach them without having too much conflict? 
Um, do you know, um, so my question for Susan would be, do you know, based on what we talked about, what their behavior style is? Do they tend to be more slow-paced and patient, in which case they would be an amiable or an analytical? Or do they tend to be more fast-paced and impatient, in which case they'd be a driver or an expressive? Um, I would personally give that person two options. Here are your choices. We can you can pay the fee that you owe, and we can get all of your things ready for you, or you can not, and we will have to go to court. I want to make sure you understand that the choices are completely in your control. Set very clear expectations as to what's going to happen, and then follow through. Okay. And I'll let you know if she types back in and, and follow up to that. But now Amy has a question. How can we figure out how to approach the more difficult personalities? I usually ask them, if you were me, how would you approach you? Um, I, I know that sounds silly, but if I'm dealing with someone who's very difficult and who's very aggressive, I will stop and say, if, if you were me in this situation, what would be the best way to address you? What would be the best way to help you? What would you like to see happen here? Um, and I would use some of those questions that I shared for de-escalating conflict, things like, what am I not understanding? Tell me a little bit more about what you're trying to do. My goal is to try to help you find a way to accomplish it, but I can't do that if you're yelling at me or being, or being aggressive. Susan said she, she, her, her tenant that's not wanting to move out is a true driver with emotional combination. Then I would say it's all about choices. Don't get in their face. The more calm you can stay, the better. Don't raise your voice because that'll just create defensiveness. Stay away from you messages. Like you said you would have your things out. You said you would pay on time. You did. Anytime you do that with a driver, um, you're going to create um, an attack. So I would say I can understand that you're frustrated. I can tell you that we have two choices. I want to help you make the one that works best for you. Here are our options. And, and leave it at that. With drivers, there's not a whole lot more that you can do. And Lisa has kind of a comment or, or a question. She says in the last couple of years, she's heard some of these things mentioned before. And uh, she says, do you agree that the only thing that won't work about this is if we ourselves are not willing to change or accept it? Absolutely. Absolutely. That's why I said at the beginning, it, it, most people um, are so busy trying to be right and not have to change what we're doing, that we forget the goal is to get it right. And I used to be very like, very much like that until having a mentally ill child where I have to focus on getting it right. And I've learned through time dealing with customers, dealing with people, dealing with my own situation with my son, that if you want the right results, you have to be willing to modify your approach. If you're not, that's OK. Just don't complain about the results you're not getting because you have to be willing to change your approach. If you're not, you can't get frustrated with the outcome. OK, and I think you kind of answered this, but Lisa said, is there a real quick way or question to find out what style someone is? And I guess the answer and to that would be I quite didn't easy. answer that, and I, I meant to. So I appreciate the follow-up on it. There are two questions you can ask. And if you go back, um, I don't know if you can go back, Holly, to the slide. Um, that had the combination of styles. Um, it was, let's see, slide, slide 17, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Go about four more, two more. There you go. So there are two questions that you can ask. The first is, what is their pace? So watch the way they walk, talk, interact with you. Are they slow-paced and patient, like let you finish your sentences and are calm and quiet? Or are they very fast-paced and impatient? And you can usually get a feel just by observing somebody, whether they're more laid back and patient or whether they're not. The next question that you ask is, what is their focus? Are they focused more on facts, results, tasks, getting it done, just being done? Or are they more focused on the people, the emotions, having the chit-chat and the discussion? So if you've got someone who is very slow-paced, patient, but they're really asking a lot of questions. They seem very detail-oriented. They're all about wanting to understand the facts. That person is analytical. If they're extremely fast-paced and impatient, and they're all about getting it done, they're a driver. If they're slow-paced and patient, and they just 
don't seem to want to ask a lot of questions and they're pretty quiet, um, they're typically amiable. If they're very fast-paced and impatient, but they're giggling and they're talking and they're showing you pictures, then they're typically more expressive. So the two questions you can ask is, what is their pace and what is their focus? Okay. Good question. And the next one is from Connie, and she says, how do you deal with a customer that avoid phone calls and they promise to come in on certain days and they just don't show up. Uh, how, you know, how would you at first approach that, I guess? What's the first step? I would leave a voicemail, again, with options and really clarify expectations at that point. Um, so if you've got someone who's avoiding phone calls, I would make a few attempts. I would understand that people are busy. But if you get to a point where you've made five or six different attempts and you still can't get a hold of that person, I would send a letter and leave a voicemail or an email. Say, um, unfortunately, we've been un unable to reach you. We have a couple of options. Here's, here's the challenge that we've, we're facing. And here are a couple of options. Please let me know which, how you'd like to proceed. You can either call me or come in um, or email me back. And so I would, I would give people choices and make it very clear what the outcome will be with each of those choices, the positive and negative consequences. So if you choose to come in or call me back, here's what's going to happen. If you don't, here's what's going to happen. And make sure that they understand what they can expect so there are no surprises. Okay, and Holly is asking, what do you do with the people who simply refuse to give you a good address and they, they lie to you all the time? And how do you really deal with not taking the lies personally? That's a hard, hard thing to do. It is very hard to do, um, and I haven't figured it out yet. As an expressive, I tend to take a lot of things personally, so unfortunately I can't give you a whole lot of advice um, on that. But I would say that it's not about you that they have other things going on in their lives that are impacting the way they're handling you. And so I would, I would be more careful on the front end with who I choose to accept as a customer. I know we all want the sale. I know times are tough. I know we're really just trying to make ends meet. But at the same time, how much time and effort is it going to take on the back end to try to manage that relationship and that customer? So if you've got someone initially who you can tell is not um, – kind of upfront and honest, I, I wouldn't be afraid to turn them away. I've had to turn customers away when I know that they're not going to be a good fit or that I'm not going to be able to provide a solution that's going to satisfy them. And I think sometimes we're so, um, we, we, we're so afraid to lose the sale that we don't necessarily do what we need to do to protect ourselves on the front end. Okay, and then I have a couple of people asking where they can go to take these tests that will help them understand more about their own personality or communication style. Do you have any recommendations for that? Yeah, you can Google um, behavioral assessment. You can Google free personality test or free behavior assessment. And there are a bunch of different you know, tools online that you can take. Some of them for a fee. Some of them are not. If you want a more in-depth report with more information on how to manage each of the styles, um, you want to look at something called the Profiles Performance Indicator uh, or the DISC. And if people want to contact me, I can help them figure out how to do that, how to get those. They're generally between $50 and $100 a piece. If you want to go online and Google free behavioral assessment, you might be able to find the colors or an animal assessment where you can go through and take those. There's also a website, that, and it sounds funny, but it's businessballs.com businessballs.com, and it's got a lot of team building activities and a lot of information about the behavior styles. So you can go in there and, and search around for different behavior styles and, and find all kinds of cool assessments in there. That's great. Amy wanted to know um, how to, what resources that you have to figure out how to handle other uh, styles not similar to your own, and I just wanted to mention to everyone that we are going to send, um, Anne has been kind enough to provide us with a little cheat sheet on the personality types and how to handle them, and you'll get that with the of the webinar after the webinar. So, And there's uh, also a resource page on my website um, that lists books that can help you do that as well. Okay. And finally, I wanted to offer every Monday morning I send out a blog. Um, sometimes it's on communication, sometimes it's on leadership or productivity or getting the behavior that you want from others. 
it's not always directly addressing customer issues, but it's always a kind of a pick-me-up with a skill or a technique. And if you'd like to receive a free copy of that Monday mornings, you can go to my website and sign up for the weekly motivation. And uh, it's not used as a marketing tool. It's simply there to be a, a resource for you. Great. Now, Amy asked another question. She wants to know, what if a tenant gives you an answer that's just not feasible? Should you just give different options, or is there a different suggestion you may have? Um, I would simply say that, unfortunately, that's not an option. Here are the two options. And I would provide two options that you can live with, um, two or three options that you can live with. Make one of them completely unrealistic and that you know that they won't explore. Um, make one something that you'd love to see happen and make one something that you can live with. Okay. And how do you politely end a conversation with a customer who is extremely talkative and demanding of your attention and time? And how do you kind of cut them off without being rude? <laughs> They're an expressive, so I would say, you know, I could sit here and talk to you all day long, but I have got so much I've got to get done. Um, I really appreciate your business and would love to continue the conversation next time I see you. I hope you have a fantastic day. Either that or I would um, let them know right when they start talking. You know, I just wanted to give you a heads up. I've got another call that I've got to make or another um, I've got to go do a, a walk the site in 10 minutes or do something. You know, say I've got about five minutes left until I need to go do something else. Um, so that when you do have to cut them off, it doesn't appear rude or disingenuous. And Holly wants to know, how, how do I refuse a customer without making them angry? Um, well, I appreciate the fact that you want to do business with us. And um, unfortunately, I'm not sure that we're going to be able to meet your expectations or that you're going to be able to meet ours. I'm happy to refer you to a couple of other facilities that might be a better fit. Good. And Lisa wants to know, do you, do you have a real quick positive result to get your feelings off your chest when someone has hurt your feelings? Is there a, maybe a technique that you could share uh, to do that? And Lisa also wanted to know your website, and I wanted to let her know that we will be putting that on at the last slide during the webinar, and she'll get that uh, as well. Everyone will get that after the, the presentation is over. Okay, so uh, my website is acclivityperformance.com, and you'll get that, but it's, it's A-C-C-L-I-V-I-T-Y performance.com. And um, what was the other question, Holly? A quick uh, positive way to get your feelings off your chest when, when someone's hurt your feelings, when you're, maybe you're just, you know, to try not to. I would say, I know, you, I know this wasn't intentional, um, I understand this wasn't intentional. Can I give you some feedback, though, about the way that that came across or the way it made me feel? Okay. Let's see. I'm just trying to read through the questions real quick. We call our, um, we call ourselves when we want to have a customer leave. When the phone rings, they normally leave. Oh, she, this is a suggestion. She says she'll have someone else in the office call. So that they have to <laughs> That's a good one, too. And, um, Nothing it, like being passive-aggressive to get the result you want. I find it works sometimes as well. It does. Uh, let's see. There's no more questions coming in right now, but I'll give people just a couple more minutes. I'm going to scroll to this final slide here. You may want to close your eyes for a second so you don't. Okay. Um, we want to definitely thank our sponsor today, Watson & Taylor. They help to keep these webinars at a reasonable price for you guys. And uh, our information for TSSA is on there as well. Feel free to email me any questions uh, that you have after the, after the presentation. And like I've mentioned, we will get you that recording. And of course, Anne's information is on there with her website and her email address and her phone number. So we'll leave that up for a second so you guys can write that down and, and also you'll, you can uh, get it after the webinar. You're, again, you're going to receive a short survey about today's webinar. Please take a moment to answer that from the level of questions I think you everyone has enjoyed themselves. And I, I hope you'll uh, give us some feedback on that. Remember, folks, I'm expressive, so I need to know that you like me and I'm good enough <laughs> and that I did an okay job. So 
Please I think you did a wonderful job, Ann. <laughs> Thank you, everyone, for con attending today. That concludes our webinar, and I hope to um, see you all in another one. Thank you.